I'm here again today with Glenn in this far reaching episode that we're going to put together here. I'm going to put us on gallery view. Um, we are tackling this issue of what is life and we're going at it through two different threads. One is to just look at the nature of entropy and how to actually uncover what's there. And the other is to um, look at physics and computational theory and how all those things intersect. And uh, I'm so excited for today's episode. And I have to let our viewers in on something that you and I have wide ranging email exchanges every week that are so rich and incredibly informative to me and get me thinking about so many things. And I really wish there was some way I could share all of that richness and background with our viewers because we can only talk about a tiny bit of it whenever we get together. But um, I'm really excited to hear what you have to say about entropy today, because I think I had a great aha moment that I can't wait to share with you. Oh, good. I'll try to fit it in there when, when, you, when you're talking. <clears throat> okay, well, on my part, I was gonna say the same thing that we've a huge amount of uh, email exchange and I had so many thoughts for today that I've forgotten like 90% of what I was going to say. So <laughs> that's good. You might have to help me. 10% of you is 100% more than I can handle. <laughs> and I did give you a list of, of, of links to put under the header of the YouTube. Yes. But I think yes. that if, if you have a, a very masochistic viewer that, that wants to dive in deeper, that, that would be a, some of the, a list of things to, to start at. Yes, I will definitely do that. Yeah, look in the and, information section and you'll find everything you need. <clears throat> another thing um, your viewers might not know, this is the first time I've ever talked about any of this with anybody except my wife, my poor patient wife. <laughs> so for words or my thoughts aren't quite, quite consistent. I had to express them um, to new listeners, so to speak. So. Well, we're, in we're, this together. We're, we're digging into things that are outside the realm of our cognitive capacity, basically. Mm -hmm. I mean, whenever you look at the structure of the universe, you're obviously going outside of your cognitive capacity. I mean, I had a thought today, you know, um, that well, when when people are talking about um, emergent systems trying to de saying that something that is strongly emergent is more than the sum of its parts. I think that's kind of completely backwards because the sum of its parts, if you actually look at the universe or even any small part of the universe and sum up the parts, when you get into combinatorial explosion and you start looking at what each one of those parts is and what it would really take to take even the sum of that one part, much less the interactions of all those parts and put them together, for anybody to have the complete arrogance to say that they can look at something and say, well, that's more than the sum of its parts, means that they don't really know what the parts are. Am I onto something there? <laughs> well, well, we'll get to that shortly. Okay. <laughs> Combinatorix explodes, and then all of a sudden, something simple comes out of all of that. So the combinatorix stuff, then you don't have to worry about. That's actually more the, closer to the notion of emergence. Is also there's a barrier there, a boundary after which you don't really care or need to know what goes on underneath. Well, so, I mean, they they use this so often when they talk about emergence in terms of consciousness being an emergent property because consciousness appears to be more than the sum of its parts. But that's, I think that's because they don't have any idea what the parts are. Uh, pretty much. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, we'll, we'll start out slow and easy and, and then we'll work our way up to emergence. As, as we, but you had mentioned, and it was a feeling that I was having that we were starting to lose our listeners on the question of entropy and computation, information, what is life? Mm -hmm. So the decision was to just dive into the deep end and um, work backwards from there if there's any questions. Yep. So, the, okay, now I have to 
jogged the, the memory. A lot of these topics that I've brought up don't actually directly tie into each other. I think that's one of the confusing um, aspects, but they all seem to share some common element that every time you, the subject comes up, you find you're talking about them together. And I, I was thinking of, of two different examples I think I've already brought up. Uh, the, uh, the blind man and the elephant um, analogy where each of the, the blind men represents a subfield in physics or biology or chemistry and in each of those areas, concepts of entropy, information, they're mathematically defined, they, they write papers, they do research, everything's fine. But it's when the blind men try to get together and share that information, uh, they find that things aren't fitting. The definitions in one field don't exactly cross over. And so there's, in, I think in the parable, they get into an argument or something, but I'm not sure. That's a sense what's happening when you discuss the origins of life. Somehow life is, is the elephant and all of these different subdisciplines or notions or concepts in physics seem to have to come together if you're gonna deal with the problem, but they're not fitting. And I gave the example of, of giving, being given a puzzle and some of the pieces don't fit. And this is a kind of an exciting thing because in physics, when things don't fit, that means you're bumping into new physics. So thinking uh, one way to define anomaly is when new information appears in your, your universe of consciousness. So the fact that things aren't fitting, rather than being dealt with as a hint that there's some new deeper level of fundamental physics at hand, they sort of uh, push it off as a metaphysical problem that we just haven't defined things correctly or, you know, uh, then you get into all these arguments that it's a lot of opinion, very little a hard, rigorous mathematical definitions. In fact, that's what bugs me is, as a mathematician, that part of me is that there's no formal definitions given for all these words that they use, even though they filled up books and videos endlessly with this stuff. Um, as regards the uh, concept of new physics, a good example I would think of is the Large Hadron Collider, LHC. Are you familiar with all that work? Mm -hmm. It came online in 2012. The, the goal was to search for the Higgs particle, which was the last piece of the standard model in physics for um, the elementary forces. And they found it the first year they ran. Um, and since then, it's been running off and on for years and has multiple upgrades. They have not seen any new fundamental particles past the Higgs, which is getting a bit disconcerting because all the theories out there that extend the standard model predicted there would, should be something. Um, but they have refined a lot, they've gotten a lot of data, you know, masses, cross sections and all that. And they know the experiment is not matching the theory. And so in physics, that's exciting. The worst thing that can happen in physics is if you go out and do experiments and it matches your theory perfectly and you're done. When things don't work, when there's anomalies, that's when physicists get excited because they know there's something new out there. They just don't know what it is. But that same thing is happening in the field of entropy information, but no one recognizes it because it's not quantitative. It's not numbers, it's more qualitative. And so I think people are kind of afraid to tackle that is what you're finding. Um, Anyway, that's just my thoughts in that direction. There's, but getting back to the subject, um, there's a, a lot of um, popular science uh, videos on uh, YouTube and places. Uh, I found uh, the PBS series, Space Time, probably the, one of the best in explaining uh, the more advanced concepts in physics at a, sort of a lay person's or, or non-technical level. But one of uh, the things that I've noticed and I wanted to express here or talk about is 
that this is a consensus, you know, we've got it solved. But the level of some of these videos, that's not true. The best you can say coming out of PBS space time is that it represents the general consensus of the moment of among physicists and scientists. But if you dig down into the, the current research, you know, the few hundred or a few thousand individuals across the planet that are actually doing it, you'll find that there is a lot of um, disagreement, a lot of questions being asked, uh, fundamental issues not being addressed and are still being debated. So I think it's one thing I, I would want to get across is, is watch these videos cautiously. If you just want to know the current research and understand what people are doing, the vocabularies are fine. But you're asking questions that go beyond <laughs> the standard or the known levels. You're, you're in the frontier with your questions. And so you, you can no longer go as a tourist. You have to go as an explorer. That's kind of where we're at. Well, does this get to kind of the larger issue that's been on a lot of people's minds right now? And I don't want to get into all the politics of it, but we're always being told to trust the science as though the science is some sort of a settled um, crystalline structure that's all perfectly resolved. But really the whole point of science is that it's a process that allows you to keep moving forward so it can't ever be that perfectly resolved crystalline structure, right? No. Well, actually, if you go back to the Greeks and start counting from 2000 plus years ago, science has been wrong about everything. <laughs> Eventually, <laughs> the theories are either go in the garbage can or they get superseded by something more comprehensive or sophisticated or detailed. Mm -hmm. um, that's one of the things um, that Thomas Kuhn brought up in his book, um, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions is if you look at the history of how science has been done, it's full of just, there's a junk box out there of all sorts of ideas that never made it and um, have long been forgotten. And so we, we get this false sense of security that science is telling us something true and that we can hang on to it. So Thomas Kuhn got into a lot of flack in, it, in his day because he suggested that to some degree, science is a human endeavor like art or music or even uh, faith, religion. And as such, you have to look at it as that. And so, but a lot of people want to see science as a recipe, a cookbook. Here's a formula, you do it and you get an answer and that's the end of the discussion. And if you dive into the philosophy of science, you'll find out that that's not the case at all. But one of the issues, of course, this is probably political um, between the coronavirus and climate change and all this, that science is being presented as we know this, um, when in fact, it's what they're saying is the best consensus of the people who have the microphone at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's I mean, it, this is not just a political statement because I've seen it all across the board in physics. Um, whoever the leading uh, researchers are in an area, they will sort of dominate a discussion and leave no room for alternate ideas. Um, it's one of the flaws of, of the academia right now is it's all about publications, grants, um, peer review articles. Well, peer review, who's doing the peer review is one of the other two or three dozen researchers on the planet that are doing the same work you do. So you don't want to peer review somebody's work too harshly because you know the next paper you submit might be peer reviewed by them. So there, it develops this good old boy network um, in the academic level that really shuts out a lot of uh, deeper debate. Well, it gets so, all tangled up with where the money is coming from too because physics can't move forward without money, so. Yeah, I don't, I, I, I don't have a fix for the situation. You know, I just pointed out, but I don't have, like my mom says, don't complain unless you think you have a better idea. Well, yeah. I don't really have a better idea. So, so but what we're kind of on the trail of something here. And, and I know you wanted to start with the big picture and work down, but I wondered if we could at least resolve uh, one point about entropy 
you you brought up something that um and i can't remember if it was in our email exchanges or in one of our talks but you were saying in general the idea is that because entropy must always increase in the universe that that is what keeps us from being able to go backwards and forwards in time because the the physics equations are equivalent on either side of the equal sign but um so they could theoretically go backwards and forwards, but not, not and still satisfy the second law of thermodynamics. So in order to satisfy that law, the arrow of time always moves forward. And that the, the, the intention of so many scientists is that because of entropy, the arrow, there must be an arrow of time. And you said, what if there just is an arrow of time and therefore entropy? Right. And then you went on to say, and I thought this was so fascinating, the, the words that you used, because the words that you used triggered a light bulb in my head. You said, since entropy is intimately associated with the direction of time, then I guess you could say that it is pulling us into the future. And when I read that, I went- Well, if I said it, it sounds good. Yeah, it sounds really good because Jordan Peterson always talks about this little glimmer of interest that's out in front of us that captures our curiosity and makes us want to move forward. And he said, that's your future calling you, that's your future self calling you forward. And so mm -hmm. this morning I'm contemplating that and I'm thinking, okay, what is the connection between that interest that's calling me forward and the concept of entropy. And maybe everybody would see this immediately, but it took me a little bit to think it through. And all of a sudden I realized, well, that little bit of interest that's calling me forward can only become something if I input energy into it. So the fact that it needs energy in order to come into being is the connection with entropy. So yes, entropy is calling us forward into the future. And here, and I'm sorry, I'm talking so much, but this is where I got really excited because I've had a couple of conversations with Nate on, on this whole idea of um, the, the problem with some of the postmodern ideas and the new age ideas is that they think about manifesting the future as something that is done by our thoughts or by our words and that we can conjure up the future based on the the words we speak we can speak it into being but the actual fact of the matter is it has to be action that brings it into being it has to be an input of energy right yep. so you can't manifest through thoughts and language you have to manifest through action yep <laughs> <laughs> so i yeah, I agree with your analogy. The, the one I would choose is the ratchet and paw mechanism. Do you know what that is? It's where a wheel has a little cog on it, and the wheel clicks up and the cog holds it. Yes. Is that what they call so, it? I saw it named something else, but it so it can have it can have several different numbers. It can be like an iron cross with four four notches, or it can have six notches i think it can't have it it can't just be any number of notches. well you're thinking of a geneva mechanism is that's not the same thing no no oh okay the, the ratchet it looks like a gear basically you have a, a big gear but instead of the teeth being triangular they're more like hard edge and there's a little dog or a little lever that comes down and as the tooth goes by it pushes it up and then the thing drops and so the wheel can't go back Oh, so, it keeps it from going backwards. Okay. Right. So entropy is like that little paw, I guess you want to call it. It's the thing, the creative effort. You're right. It takes energy to create, and the energy it you create, you it's like turning the wheel. And entropy is the thing that comes down and keeps stuff from going back, undoing. the The other way to to think about it is is activation energy. It's a, you've got to put energy into stuff. People understand there's a certain activation energy and then you get over a hump and then things have to they come down to a stable point now. Well, you've got to get rid of all that excess energy. Otherwise things will just slouch around and go back down. 
So that's where entropy shows up. You come up over, you get enough. And then once you're here, entropy pulls out that extra energy and allows you to stay in that little new higher um, stable minimum. Is that, is that the connection with Carl Friston's idea of the free energy principle? It might be. I have to have to spend some time and think about that again. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, okay. That. So yeah, you you can't have creativity without entropy. So, okay, I missed what you just said because you you went out. You, you can't, can't have creativity without entropy. You can't have creativity without because entropy. Because you're right. You have to dissipate that system so that it, it keeps it from part. I guess I'm trying to agree with you. Well, but the way you say it is always so brilliant. And I just missed the second part of that again, because you cut out. You said you can't have creativity without entropy because, and then I lost you. Oh, it takes excess energy to get things over the activation hump to a new stable minimum. And you have to dissipate that excess energy somehow. Otherwise, the created order that you've made will just fly fly back apart wow that's so great i mean that that works through every single level of reality right right down to mm -hmm. when you're working out or <laughs> well i had a physics professor he he his phrasing of the second law was it takes energy to create order and it takes energy to maintain order and I, I've often thought if, if you consider the process of creating and maintaining new order as a definition of creativity, then uh, the people who maintain existing order are just um, as much engaged in the creative process as those who, who uh, make stuff new. So an architect might design a building, but then there are construction workers who put it together and then there's maintenance people who keep it going day in and day out. The, you know, the maintenance people are the ones that fight entropy that wants to tear the building down. And I think that all should qualify as creative effort coming out of society. I don't think we yeah. always appreciate that. Yeah, and if we had more of that, there would be more, um, in Jordan Peterson's words, there would be more of a willingness to, to um, dive into the belly of the beast to rescue the father. <laughs> Because, because the father is not just our father, but the father is the whole past that created this environment that we live in today, mm -hmm. that, that you know, dug the sewers and put up the telephone poles and, and maintain the water systems and the electrical systems and, and all of that. That's our father and, and not just that, but the science and the technology that allowed that to develop and, and all of that is our father and not just that, but the philosophy that allowed those sciences and technologies to become what they are. That's all of our father. And if we are not willing to rescue that and prevent its destruction, then we are, we are tetherless, man. We are without a tether. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you can only play the deconstruction game once, so to speak, and uh, then you're done. Yeah, so I had one other thought. I'm, gonna, I'm probably getting you off target, but I had this thought. Um, we were talking about Turing machines. Well, we were at the base, we've been talking about the lock and the key mechanism mm -hmm. and that, that there's an inherent intelligence built into a lock and key mechanism. And so, I'm thinking about that and I'm thinking, okay, so the tumblers uh, recognize whether they're, what's the correct key that has been put into the lock. And if it is the correct key and, and there's an outside agent that turns that key, the tumblers will open and, and the door can unlock. So there's, um, there's only one case in which the door will unlock and that's when the key fits the, the mechanism. There's two cases when the door will not unlock, when there is no key or when it's the wrong key. And, and I started thinking that seems to me like it's true of everything, that there are always more ways that something cannot be done than that it can be done. So 
um, if you're thinking about molecular bonds, you have a negative and a positive and they will connect. If you have a negative and a negative, it will not connect or a positive and positive, it will not connect. Or if there's neutral, it will not connect. It's only if, only if, so mm -hmm. that if then else. If this one thing happens then, but if it's anything else, all these other possibilities, it won't happen. And it seems to me there's something really fundamental about that too, that that there's only one, one way. So what? how does that connect up with all of this? Well, I think partly you're recognizing what I think they call it the combinatoric explosion mm -hmm. of the possibility of ways not to do something. Mm -hmm. Yet somehow out of all of that combinatoric explosion, there is one way that actually ends up working. Mm -hmm. that's, the, that's the magic that comes out, I think. Mm. I have to think about that one. Well, so yes, that that's the magic, let's say. But now, if we think about um, emergence in terms of when when there's an unpredictability involved in the emergence, then um, it seems to me there's several ways that something can be unpredictable. One way is even if you know the rules, it can be unpredictable, right? Mm -hmm. It can be unpredictable when you don't know the rules. And it can be unpredictable even if there are no rules. Yeah, all of the above. Yeah, so, so how can any scientist actually make a determination of unpredictability in emergence. Okay, I'm going to wind this all the way back to the beginning of the universe. Okay. At the <laughs> or or maybe you want to just wait for the talk to go a little bit farther and then we can come back to this because I, okay. I think I'm going okay. to address the, the, some foundational work for that first. Okay, okay, I gotcha. Mm -hmm. I am I'm dutifully so, humbled. <laughs> Well, I know you're just you're just in a hurry. Yeah, I'm just excited. I'm excited. Okay, so let's so, get started. Uh, so we're back to the elephant. You know, what is this one thing that all of these you know, entropy, computation, information, um, all of these have one thing in common, and that's the notion of irreversibility. And um, what I, it seems like the universe is trying to tell us is that the universe is fundamentally at some level irreversible and that's how we're experiencing all of these all of these different words are ways of expressing or experiencing that irreversibility so the second law is not driving the direction of time it's a consequence of that and we can talk about mathematical ways to give uh, the universe a time and direction but for the moment just assume that it is and it, irreversibility is a fundamental aspect of of the universe we live in now the immediate complaint or you know challenge to that is that all the laws of physics are reversible and that is correct mm -hmm. All the laws of physics are written using calculus and differential equations, which once you've gone into the world of continuous and differentiable functions, they are by definition reversible. So the question is, is the, irrever the reversibility of, of the laws of physics a function of what the universe really is, or is it a function of the mathematical models we're using to describe the laws of physics? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I think that came up in one of the emails. And this gets us into an area that um, really ties into the history of physics. And it goes back to something from Plato. And it has the notion of to save the phenomena mm -hmm. or to save the appearances. I think you've probably heard that phrase before. Um, I think there's a book, Barfield might have done a book by that name. Owen Barfield, yeah. Yes, but he didn't tackle it in the same way that it is in science. And I, it's something that young students, uh, 
not made aware of, that in the end, all what we're doing is creating mathematical models that describe or reproduce what we see in the natural world around us. But the models are not what the universe is doing. And I think it took me a while to figure that one out and finally to, to grok it. But I don't think it's being taught much in, um, in colleges anymore. It, but it ties in the history. I mean, you, that, that idea has been a stalking horse for uh, physical theories going back to the Greeks. And it was one of the arguments that the Catholic Jesuits brought up to Galileo. Um, in fact, that's where the first time I heard it was when I was digging into the history of, of what happened to Galileo and realized that the Catholic Church actually had a lot of things right. Um, but that's a, um, a talk or conversation for another day. So maybe we should have a whole episode on that. On the yes. Galileo thing. I think that would be a fascinating episode. It, it would be because 90% or more of what you think you know is wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's histories of history. So, but if, if we can just accept for the moment that irreversibility is a fundamental universe and that that's maybe what we're experiencing, again, there's plenty of people who will disagree with me in physics, but there are people, if you go out there and dig deep into the philosophy and the corners of research, there are voices um, similar to mine, so I don't feel too alone. So I think the next step might be to show or start talking about computation, return to that. Mm -hmm. And that's, um, you've mentioned Turing machines, but the simplest computational system is just called state machine or a finite state machine. And this little um, YouTube clip from a com computer file, I, I recommended it that people should watch the whole thing, but we're just gonna look at about a minute of it. Okay. And he's talking about a parking meter that takes money and gives you a ticket back. And this is a little extended version of our key and lock uh, example. Okay, I'll bring it up. Um, share sound, optimize the video clip, and let's see. No, this is George Ellis. I the know, other one. I'm trying to get at the other one. Okay. Okay. It it um, always brings up all these dialogue boxes and everything. Mm -hmm. I have to get rid of. Okay, here we go. So commonplace, okay. they've been with us for ages. But the crucial thing I want to emphasize is the following. If you're sitting there in the 15 state, all that this machine says or knows inside itself, if you like, is I am in the 15 state. If you say to it, but how did you get there? It would say, I don't know. I just don't know. I retain no memory of the coins I've had to get me to this state at all. I just know I'm in 15. It could have been 10 and 5. It could have been 555. Five, five. Who cares? I'm in a 15 state. So that is why these are machines with no need for memory. They're, if you like, a processing system that accepts coins. And you could perhaps argue it's the ultimate special purpose computer. It's a special purpose dumb computer that vends tickets for a parking lot. Only thing it does need is when you put in a coin, every single coin, it needs a holding position. You could think of this as being like a sort of register inside a central process unit. It holds the current coin and often will examine it. And of course, in the early days, all it could do to check it was valid was maybe weigh it. Nowadays, you can shine lasers well, at them, you can do cut spectroscopic it off, think, analysis, and all sorts. To mm -hmm. So, since you missed the first part of the, the video, it's, it's a parking uh, meter. You put coins into it, and the meter counts up the coins. And if you get 25, well, it's English pence, then it puts out a ticket for you so you can go park. So it's, um, it's simply counting coins and you could have a five or a 10, 20 pence piece in England. 
And so the computational mechanism, it's a state machine. It just counts up coins until you get 25 or more and prints out the ticket. What he's pointing to is that if you've got 15 pence put into it, you don't know if that was three fives or a 10 and a five or a five and a 10. Once a certain stage in computation is passed, information has been lost. You can't, you know, um, your memory of the past is gone. I think I've tried to, to make that analogy before. Mm -hmm. Now, this is, this is an example of an irreversibility in computation. It's gotten to a state it doesn't know what, how to go backwards now because all that information is lost. Now, there's um, a principle in physics is called Landauer's principle, named after a physicist, Rolf Landauer. And sometimes it's called Landauer's eraser. And people have proposed it as a function to Maxwell's demon. But essentially he was an engineer and studying the minimum energy required to do computation in integrated circuits, for example. And he recast the problem from into one of um, theory of computation. And he realized that when you go through a logic gate, you lose information. And when you lose information, the entropy of the universe has in some way gone up. And so the information with entropy. And so this is the, the big daddy that connects computation information with entropy and energy all centers around Landauer's principle. And at a microscopic level, at a quantum mechanics level, Landauer's um, principle has been proven experimentally. So that's not a question. Uh, whether it applies to classic systems as opposed to quantum systems, that's an open debate. And that's one we can have if someone wants to, but it's, it gets pretty technical. So here's the connection. Um, that's why entropy, energy, all these don't by themselves have anything to do with life. But Landauer's principle seems to be one of the places where they all come together and, and unite. And um, the other thing he brought up in that short video about the, the holding phase, where that you have to examine the coin, that's Carl Friston's sensory stage or what I use uh, asking the questions. That's the point when the computational system extracts. The computational system extracts what? Information, sorry. I'm not Some sure if from... your computer or my computer, um, but, but we're cutting out fairly frequently a little bit, but we're still getting most of it, so. The okay. computational system extracts information. Is that what you said? Yeah, it pulls information from its environment. Okay. And that would be Carl Friston's sensory stage in his model. Well, so can I ask a question about that? Yes. Um, I don't want to get us too far off target, but. Um, When you talked about macrostates and microstates, in the, the microstates are the, the numbers of positions inside the system, the potential number and locations inside the system. The macrostates are the environmental variables that are, I think, both inside and outside the system, mm. or only outside the system. I would always go with the outside view. Only outside. So you, you can take a t pressure gauge inside of a, a box and measure pressure inside. But pressure really represents the force on the walls of the box in the end. So yeah, it gets a little bit subjective how you want to do it. Um, OK, well, I'll hold my question. I'll hold my question. Keep going. Okay. Okay. 
So one of the, the nice things that I liked about the parking meter, it's a little bit more extended than the, the lock and key, but you can do a parking meter with electronics, transistors, as opposed to gears or relays. Now, an individual transistor is a completely determined, determined, uh, determined and predictable device. You can write equations, a differential equation, you can model it, you can know everything about it, and, but it, can't it doesn't compute. And you can put a pile of transistors together and wire them in all sorts of ways. You know, the combinatoric explosion happens um, of all the different ways you can wire uh, six transistors together, let's say, and then you can put some voltage or current to it. Nothing might happen, it might burn up, or it could go into some chaotic or um, harmonic, you know, periodic behaviors. But you don't know until you actually try it. Now, a very specific ordering in those transistors will actually now perform a computation. The computation is not in the transistors, but it somehow is, in, it's in the order that the transistors are put together. The order it's programming. Uh, well, that would be like the AGTC in the DNA strand. They have to be in a specific order. Mm -hmm. Or the orders of proteins um, that are the orders of amino acids that are connected together to create a protein, they have to be in a specific order in order to fold up properly and create the function. So it's a right. kind of a principle, right? Mm -hmm. So this is I'm, this is starting to get the hints of, of what emergence is that um, you put a collection of transistors together and who knows how many different ways you can wire them up. But there is one way you could wire them up and all of a sudden they will perform a computation if you input and output in the right, right way. So emergence is that new thing that happens. This, the ability to compute now is an emergent property or behavior of this collection of transistors. Um, and the parking meter again, you interact with it just by putting coins in and you getting a little piece of paper printed out. It doesn't matter from your point of view as a, somebody driving a car and looking for a parking space, what happens inside. So that's a, another hint that you're looking at emergence that what's inside is irrelevant to how you interact with it from the outside. And that's how they use or should be using the phrase, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts that when you put a bunch of transistors together in just the right way, it becomes a computer. If you put relays or whatnot in just the right way together inside of a, a metal box, it will count coins and give you a parking. So something new has happened. The parking meter is not an element of any gears. But there's two things there. That it, there also has to be an input. It's mm -hmm. not just it's not just the order that the transistors are connected together. They're connected together in the certain specific order, and then there is an input. And yes. then, and then it's not just that, but the the simplification process only takes place when you interact with it from the outside. So there needs to be an agent on the outside interacting with it. So there's Bingo. input at the beginning. There's an agent at the beginning, there's an agent at the end, right? Right, and then there's a, a whole bunch of complexity in between, but it's it's hidden in a black box. Yeah. And, and that black box is a boundary, and uh, I always like to use a threshold of complexity to describe that transition. And, and you, is that something that you see that the, the, the whole universe is like uh, nested, these... these uh, that's how I see it, and that's how are nested, smaller, larger, you know, all the way, all the way out. The whole thing is just nested, nested, nested inside larger and larger boundaries. Mm -hmm. But then, okay, so now you're at the outside boundary of the universe, um, and we're always offloading entropy. But we, um, in order for our universe to work the way it does entropy must always increase. Mm 
Mm -hmm. So very obviously, we're not offloading entropy outside the universe. No. Nope. Which seems to imply that whatever is outside the universe is, is perfectly balanced. Well, speaking of physicists, I can't talk about anything outside yes, of the universe. Course. But I'm just saying, I'm just saying, as I think about it, yeah. it has implications about what is outside of our universe. I think mm -hmm. that the fact that we are not, the fact that our universe wouldn't function if we offloaded entropy outside the universe has implications for what's outside the universe. Yeah, I've, I've wondered about that and I haven't got any good answers. That um, well, that's what we're doing is wondering. It's okay. Mm -hmm. to have answers. <laughs> well, perpetual motion of the first kind is one that violates conservation of energy, and the perpetual motion of the second kind is one that violates the second law. So, I rephrase that wonderment as well: What would happen if we had a perpetual motion machine? If such a thing was possible, and I, I have no idea. Maybe somebody could post their thoughts, but. What is perpetual motion of the first kind and second kind? I've never heard in that breakdown. Okay, first kind is, is a machine that violates conservation of energy. You know, these, these kind of wheels with balls that roll around or something with magnets that, that you get the wheel going and it'll just keep going. Completely frictionless. Right, and then the second kind are when people say we're drawing energy out of the universe or we're pulling something in from out of the universe. So uh, Anne Rand's uh, Atlas Shrugged, that was one of the difficulties with her, her motor in that one. It, it was a well, perpetual it's motion. A fundamental machine misunderstanding of what's outside of the universe. That's yeah, but it was still a good story. <laughs> the archetypes were correct. OK, so I'll keep going. OK. Well. I've just given you one definition of, of, I don't know, a whole zoo or menagerie full of definitions you can find out there. But I've always liked, I choose the definitions that give, are most useful, that give you the, the greatest insight, that lead you to even further uh, insights. And if you, you think of emergence as crossing a barrier, when something complicated becomes simple again, then the first thing it implies is the layering that you've just talked about that the universe is layers of emergence and that pressure temperature or coins and a parking meter uh, ticket those imply that there's another level up that's acting on the lower level mm -hmm. so that suggests that there's another layer up which is potentially becomes another emergent phenomenon so i i find that intriguing uh, that definition of, or the way I define emergence blends itself to the, what's the Russian dolls? I can never pronounce that. Layering of well, the universe. Well, so what, what else that says to me is that, that um, when, when you use the term emergent phenomena and you explain it the way you do, I get a completely different picture of the meaning of emergence than I do when, for example, Carl uses the word emergence. Mm -hmm. When Carl uses the word emergence or, or when I hear a lot of science programs talking about emergence, they seem to be saying that emergence is something that arises up out of the simpler things and magically becomes more complex, arising up out of these simpler things and Therefore, there's no need for any, uh, anything greater because all the greatness will arise up out of the simple things. And ultimately, they, they, some of them even say that God is an emergent property of the universe, as though the universe happened on its own and then God happened to arise up out of it. But when I hear you talking about emergence, more of what I hear is that emergent properties serve the lower levels. So, and, and this is a picture, and I know you're only speaking from a physics level, but I mean, I'm bringing in the faith side of things here. Mm -hmm. So, so 
um, when Jordan Peterson talks about hierarchy, hierarchy is, is uh, built of all these people working competently to try to build something. And as they move up level after level after level, the most competent people and the ones that produce the most benefit are the ones that as they move up, they loop back down to the beginning and support those that are underneath and help them to move up so that you have this continual motion from the top coming mm -hmm. back down. And that's exactly the way Jonathan Peugeot talks about um, the, the symbolism of Christ or the picture of God that, that he's at the top, but he's also at the bottom, mm -hmm. holding everything and bringing it back up. And when I hear you talking about emergence, that's the picture I get from a scientific standpoint. I mean, I, maybe I'm reading way too much into it, but. Mm, uh, yeah, but I, I think it's actually <laughs> more more challenging uh, faith-wise. Uh, if you talk about what they call strong emergence, mm -hmm. that has one of the, its hallmarks is a downward causality. Yes. The, um, you can think of layers of emergence or layers of complexity is that um, emergence creates new order, but then out of new order, you can have experience emergence again and create even a higher level up. Well, would an example of that be human consciousness actually impacts um we can we we can impact our own genetic structure by decisions that are made by our human consciousness one way or another you know mm -hmm. if i start eating all the wrong things or you know whatever i can actually impact the epigenetics of what affects me as a yeah. human person that's a downward causality right that we are, I think, might be the only animal species which now we can control our own Darwinian evolution by the choices we make and the societies we create. Mm -hmm. So be careful what kind of society you create because who knows down the road, a few generations, what, you're, what you might be breeding. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, uh, I'm not sure I. Hmm. I have a hard time with that. Like, just let it blow away like chaff, okay? The wind comes along and just blows away the chaff and <laughs> just go on with what you're thinking. <laughs> yeah, I, I trust that people are onto something. You know, I, I, I don't always see it because I'm I'm me and I have a certain experience and background, but I trust that people are onto something and I need to pay attention. So, but beyond that, I, I don't have any authoritative opinions on it. Mm -hmm. But back to the, the question of, of the vending machine, or I mean, in this case, the, the parking meter, the fundamental irreversibility of, of computation. And again, the computation implies irreversibility, but the question I ask, if the universe didn't have irreversibility built in at some fundamental level, then computation would not be possible to start with. That's the deeper question. Could you unpack that? Um, if the universe was perfectly reversible, then computation couldn't go forward because you couldn't, you wouldn't be allowed to forget. Everything would somehow always be there, and it, it gets fuzzy. I don't, I don't have an answer for this, um, but somehow there's a contradiction in there that my intuition keeps bumping into, which keeps me coming back. Um, it's based on a choice. The, the logic gate can't make a decision if else then, if it wasn't allowed to make a choice. That means, or an action, let's just call it an action or a response. But if its action was predetermined, then it didn't have a choice. So if the, the parking meter knew what you were going to put in ahead of time, and it, as if, if it was a determined system, then it would have to have known what coins were in your pocket. 
but what coins were in your pocket had to have been predetermined by something earlier before that. And, and then you end up going all the way back to the beginning of the universe that somehow at the moment of the Big Bang, it was already determined that on a certain day you would have three coins in your pocket and you would put them into that particular parking meter would be there and the ticket would come out. But that's kind of hard to accept. I think most people have a trouble with that. So it's either that or the parking meter wasn't determined until you put the coins in. And the coins in your pocket wasn't determined until whatever choices you made. More way forward. The future is not predetermined. That's another way to put it. That a choice means that there's a fork in the road into the future and you can intelligently or some in some manner pick a pathway forward. So computation, computation relies on the world being non-deterministic. Right. That I, again, I, it's probably that's pretty big. That's pretty big there. <laughs> so I've been thinking that about is, stuff like this for you know. 15, 20 years, and I, I don't expect people to, to agree with it or appreciate it or, but it's kind of a place I finally come to. You, you, you humble yourself, maybe that's the word. You, you pound your head on the physics for a long time and then finally one day you're humbled. Just, okay, I have to accept this. I think I've covered everything I can remember I wanted to say about immersion, um, about the, the computation and how it connects back to entropy and how it pulls everything together. Mm -hmm. So I thought the next step would be, let's start talking about emergence. Okay. Because that's, computation is, is um, a, a classic physics phenomenon. I, I'm, I'm not ready to say that at the quantum mechanical level that computation is actually possible. Um, computation is a classic system, um, but that's a debate we can have. Someone can challenge me on that. I've left, uh, one of the links I left, I think, um, for your header was um, a PBS channel on the web called Closer to Truth. Mm -hmm. I imagine some of your listeners have at least found it. And there's a narrator, um, Robert Kuhn, and he basically goes out and, and interviews the leading people in different areas of research and records these interviews. And he's, it's, it's been going on 10 years. So there's a, quite an archive of, of interviews. In the process, he's interviewed a, a, probably all of the leading authorities or spokespeople in the area of emergence. And most of these interview clips are 10 minutes, give or take. So they're, they're not hard to listen to. So if you if you go to the Closer to Truth site, website and, and then search on emergence, it will give you a lot of um, links to conversations with the leading authorities on emergence. And then you can listen and, and come up to speed with what's out there. I, I gave a link, there's a book, Reemergence of Emergence. Uh, which would, if people would rather read, that's a, a, the best source I've found. And I, I did scan it into PDF format if someone doesn't want to spend the money for it. Um, I do have it on file, <laughs> probably not exactly legal. But they cover emergence from physics and math all the way through computers, through biology, neuroscience, they have they interviews um, theologians. So you get this huge wide perspective from all sorts of disciplines, uh, the leading people, experts talking about it. And so if someone's interested in emergence, uh, that's the place to deep dive and, and listen to what people's opinions are. One of the emails I, I left, I pointed out that there is no subtopic in the field of sciences called emergence. All the people who speak on emergence are researchers who encounter it or deal with it in their own particular discipline. So if, 
Robert Kuhn interviews a neuroscientist who will might talk about emergence in terms of consciousness or um, David Chalmers, um, I think he linked, he's another um, outspoken person. He speaks, his background is mathematics and philosophy. So he speaks as a philosopher. Um, they all have their own little bit of language. I've listened to probably just about all of these at one point in time or another. And I finally grew a bit frustrated because no one was giving me a hard definition um, of what emergence was. And that's why I've tried to give you the one that I have because it, it gives me something rigorously that I can use. One of the big areas of emergence that, that causes a confusion is there's weak, there's strong emergence. Mm -hmm. And a lot of your spokespeople will, will mix them and just use emergence and not distinguish between the two, which is important. Just a, as a highlight, weak emergence uh, validates the materialistic, the physicalist point of view. Strong emergence contradicts that and actually tends to more validate the, the more theological Jordan Peterson point of view. So the different takes on emergence actually play out in radically different views of the universe at a philosophical or spiritual level. That's curious. Um, one of the areas that you'll hear talked about is complexity, mm -hmm. um, self-organized criticality, non-equilibrium thermodynamics. Um, that's a, a rather frustrating um, thing for me as a physicist to listen to. I would characterize complexity theory kind of as a, a farmer's market of ideas where a lot of different disciplines can come together and share thoughts and ideas on emergence, um, but by itself is not a discipline. So oftentimes you'll hear emergence used as, as like a magic word. Things get really complex and then something emerges and we have consciousness. Um, that always troubles me that it's used in such an ill-defined way. So again, if you listen to these, you'll start to pick up on that, that um, I think it's called the uh, I know it when I see it argument. Have you heard that? <laughs> it goes back to uh, a Supreme Court judge. Apparently there was a case before the U.S. Supreme Court that had some connection to pornography. And one of the, the judge famously or infamously said, I can't tell you what it is, but I know it when I see it. And I think emergence falls into that category. People know it when they see it but they can't really tell you what it is. And so if, if I was a 25 or 30 year old grad student all over again, I think that would, trying to come up with a form. So, so basically um, what, what they're saying is that whenever they see something they can't explain, they just call it emergence. Right. Um, especially if you get into biology, philosophy, neuroscience, their example of, of emergence is, is the go-to example is consciousness. That somehow out of all the, 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 the chemicals and neurons that form the brain, somehow consciousness emerges. Um, they use it in that sense, and it, it's, it's like a magic term. I don't, I, I don't agree but they don't have any other way to put it. They see something happening, but they don't know. And I think one of the problems is that their examples of strong emergence are things like human consciousness. Emergence happens at some incredibly simple systems. Um, game of life, I don't know uh, if you've ever played, uh, watched that. It's a, it's a two rule game, uh, cellular automata that has been shown to be Turing complete. It's a universal, it's maps to a universal Turing machine, which means that the game of life has behaviors which are non-decidable. Um, so you remember Turing, that was his famous um, 
point of his Turing machine was to create a mathematical formalism so that he could uh, prove or disprove Hilbert's uh, decidability problem challenge. Mm -hmm. Okay, now that's one of the videos I think I linked to in the header. Mm -hmm. But I'm not sure how many of your um, listeners, most are probably familiar with Gödel's incompleteness theorems. That Kurt Gödel was able to show that there are things that are logically true but cannot be proven within the framework um, of math logic to be true. So Turing did so, a similar thing for algorithms and problems in computation, that he showed there are problems which are undecidable computationally, even if you had a computer that could run forever. So um, game of life, which I say is a silly automaton with only two rules, and it's a checkerboard pattern, has that um, undecidability aspect to it already. So you don't have to go to human consciousness to look for something like strong emergence where something comes out of nothing. Now, I think and I, I have just- I need to clarify here something here. <clears throat> so so when, um, if we're talking about the, the game of life, the, mm -hmm. um, I have heard about some of the cellular automata that the outcome actually is um, I'm going to use the wrong terminology here, but the outcome actually is certain, but the only way that you can ever know what the outcome is, is to run the whole program. Mm -hmm. That that at some point it will end and it will be um, I'm not saying this right, but that's one of the undeci undecidable questions is will it ever end and give you an answer. Oh, so, so you can't know unless, until you run the whole program. If you run the whole program and it ends, then you know. But if it doesn't end, you never know. But the only way you can find out is to keep running it. And mm -hmm. so you might have to run it for a trillion years and still never know. Run it for the lifetime of the universe and like, you never like know. Like pi, I guess. It would be like mm -hmm. pi, right? So is this that, is what that's, it, that's what it means when they say undecidable. Right. There's no algorithm. You can't write a computer program that will look at a particular computer program and tell you whether it will finish or not. Okay, maybe that's a better way to put the undecidability question. So what's the difference between undecidable and unpredictable? Uh, boy, that's a challenge. I, I would tend to use them. Um, as synonyms. Okay, okay. Uh, but a lot of the problems with emergence is, is the use of words like undecidable, non-deterministic, um, demonstrable. Uh, I think David Chalmers has said in one of his papers that I've read that um, he called them gliders, but it's a reference to the game of life that it is. Um, demonstrable, so therefore it's not an example of, of strong emergence. And I thought, no, David, that's that's wrong. Um, demonstrable just means you run it and you see what happens. And if, so, um, but that's not the same as decidable because there might be things out there that you haven't found yet, even though you've tried 10,000 different combinations. Um, this gets back to Stephen Wolfram and his project for a theory of everything. I think you've come up. That's one of the things that would come out of uh, the universe being, has some irre irreversibility at a level, is that it hints that the universe might be computational at some fundamental level. And his approach, his theory of everything is to 
look at things in terms of cellular automata and cellular automata are state machines and computational little elements. So he's working on a theory of everything to explain life, universe and all starting with um, computation as his core element. And I think that in the long run will be something what you'll see in the future. Um, now I forgot where I was going with this. Well, so I'll ask you a question and maybe I'll get you back there. Um, so the cellular automata in Stephen Wolfram's theory of everything, some of them create incredibly beautiful and complex things that are, you could never look back and figure out where it came from if you were just looking at it in the moment, you know, cut it off at some particular moment in time and look at it. Um, but you said cellular automata are state machines. So does that mean that that um, when you look at it in any particular moment in time, basically it has no it has no memory of what came before, no way to go back to where it came from? Yeah, each each cell, you know, this game of life is on a, like a checkerboard. And the, the, the cell has a lights up, you know, on or off or however you want to call it, depending on the neighbors. And then each cycle, you, you evaluate all your neighbors and then you change. And so the whole game goes in kind of a ka-chunk, ka-chunk, ka-chunk. And then you see these patterns come up. The state machines are the individual cells because that's where the decision is being made as to what the next state will be. So the cellular automata live on an, a vast array of coupled finite state machines. Yeah. So again, that, I like definitions that point to mathematically solid ways to develop the problem. So this would um, give me a, a chance to to turn strong emergence into a state machine or theory of computation problem. Now I think I've just lost everybody again. No, I well, I, I'm thinking of it in terms of my artistic process. And, and so this is telling me something about myself that I never really understood because whenever I launch into a painting, I'm always, um, I always approach it with a what if question. Mm -hmm. And, um, so I end up trying a lot of different things. And sometimes the result is completely unpredictable from the way I started. And, and sometimes I like the result, sometimes I don't. <clears throat> but on the times that I like the result, my impulse is to say, yes, this is how I'll do it from now on. <clears throat> but I have no memory of how I got to where I was at the end because, because the process is basically built on a series of random steps of randomness. And, mm -hmm. and because of the randomness, I can't reproduce the same result time after time. The randomness always leads me to something new. Mm -hmm. so every, almost every painting I do is a completely different style because I can't, I can't recollect, I can't rebuild the style of the one before. So that's what it makes me think about. <laughs> yeah, so the, the choice is made. What? And if, the, your painting is a sequence of choices made. Yes. And depending on the moment, who knows what, you make different choices as you go. But there's also um, a top-down causality. Somehow the paint, painting is trying to probably tell you what it wants to be. Am, yeah. am I close on that? Yes. Uh huh. So, yeah. yeah. So the emergence. There's a there's a, a layer above you which is trying to tell you what the painting should be, and then you're doing this little random walk, being guided by that intuition. And so, yeah. in some cases, there's something about science that works that way too. Yeah, I I, I assume so. Uh, that gets back to Nima Harkani uh, Hamid's comment about the capital T truth that somehow it's it's telling you what it, it wants to be and, and, and informing you and that's why science can be done because there's something outside of us as physicists which is guiding us along a certain path and we all sense it 
It's that little curiosity so, that's glimmering out in front of us. That's our future calling us forward. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, normally it's, it's <laughs> the, the universe is putting new, uh, new information into your, into your world and, and making you, giving you opportunities or choices to make. That's, that's a question. A dangerous statement for a physicist to make, Glenn. <laughs> Well, I don't know. I'm a funny person, but you know, I, I designed electronics hardware. You know, I mean, you know, ICs, resistors, capacitors, PC board, and I always had this feeling that the the design was telling me what it wanted to be. You, you look at the parts available. You go to the manufacturers. You you know, you look at the distributors. You know. And then as you integrate this all together, you know how big the package has to be, you know how the users want to interface with it. And somehow the electronics would tell me what it wanted to be. And I thought, that's, I'm not gonna talk about that to other people. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I'm sure you're not alone in feeling that way. It's just not de rigueur to be talking about it. It's I know. not allowed, it's not allowed. But it's out there, and I think that's one of the aspects of, of thinking in terms of layers of emergence, is that there's other layers above us and that we're somehow sensing that and pulling us forward. So I often think um, the notion of transcendence, that life has some kind of trans transcendent value to it, is we're experiencing some layer up higher of consciousness of which we are a, a bit or part in, and it's pulling us, it's informing us. Well, the so. way the way Nate put it in our conversation yesterday, which we'll probably publish next week sometime, is that the invisible and the unknown are always shining through the visible and the particular. Mm -hmm. So the more you focus on, the more you're willing to really pay attention you've used this word a number of times the more you're willing to really pay attention to the visible and the particular the more likely you are to see the transcendent shining through mm -hmm. well the other way i put it is is new physics is always in the corners the margins the the, the error bars and so you have to look close and you have to be patient and that's when you see the new stuff and i, I don't know if this adds is, is appropriate, but it fits in. In the years I TA'd uh, physics classes, I did mostly introductory physics labs. And I have a few students out of all the hundreds that I still remember. And there's one in particular, and I always wondered what happened to her, and she was an artist. And she came into the labs and she had the ability to see things that other, none of other my students saw. Because as, as the lab guy, I, I knew the equipment wasn't that good. And one of the things that really is irritated me out of high school was that students think I have a lab book to do, so therefore I'm gonna write down the results that are expected. And I would go, you know, I know you can't do that because the lab equipment's not that good. She would actually, and she, because she's an artist, she could diagram what she's done very well. But she had an attention to detail. And there was one experiment where you, Hooke's Law, you put a mass on a spring and it goes up and down and you time the, the oscillations and you change the mass. And then you, you eventually get a plot. She was doing the plot and everyone else would do like five or six points and then draw a straight line textbook said apparently she noticed an anomaly that the numbers weren't making a straight line and so all of a sudden now she started taking smaller and smaller increments of, of weights so if you took the looked at the standard textbook hooks law you get a nice straight line of you know for the experiment she found the little loopy x and i thought when i saw that i would just went yes and what she had saw is if you have a spring going up and down with a mass, there's a point when it becomes a pendulum and it starts doing this. And then it turns into a complete pendulum for a, a few motions and then it starts gradually going back to up and down again. And she found that. And she was the only one that ever did of all my students. 
it's because she paid attention. And I've often decided that's the, the artist's ability to, is to see things that other people don't. The, the hardest thing sometimes in life is to see what's right in front of you. So anyway, that's well, my plug the, for artists. The interesting, the interesting thing about that is that that's a, that's a learned skill. It's not something you're born with. I mean, I, mm. I didn't have that. I didn't have that curiosity until I started taking watercolor classes when I was 50 years old. Mm -hmm. And I had a teacher who insisted that if you're gonna paint, you have to be looking at what you're painting. You have to really see what's there. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna paint a shadow, you have to look at the shadow and see what colors are really in the shadow. And you have to look at the shadow and see what the edges really look like. They're, it's not a, just a hard shape on the ground. It's got soft edges in certain places and softer, softer edges in other places and it shifts tone and you have to get very specific about how you look. And so I learned to really look at things, but it wasn't something that came naturally to me by any means. So maybe it does come naturally to some people, but it is also mm -hmm. a learned skill. Yeah. But the thing is with, with my students as, as a teacher of TA, kids don't trust themselves. I mean, they don't trust their intuition. It doesn't fit what's in the textbook. So therefore I'm not gonna push, I'm not gonna trust my own intuition that what I'm seeing is real, even, because, even if it disagrees with what is expected. And so she was able to go that place that none of my other students ever did. But that's a metaphor or something in there about how we as a society treat science to begin with, I think. Well, I think there's and also there said, for just how how little we really, how terrified we are to actually know ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it also says the new things, the places where we grow or will expand our knowledge, intelligence, is always at the margins, the corners, that, that one little thing that doesn't fit, that draws your attention and you start asking yourself questions, well, why? What, you know, what's bugging me about this? Well, is so all of this leading you forward to something in your own work? Do you feel like you're progressing towards a goal that you have? Uh, well, the thing I'd really love to get back to is, is machine learning. I think that's how we first got together. And I've since I retired, I've pretty much let a lot of the electronics go. Um, but that's one way I've gotten to this place was dealing with robotics. Um, my interest specific, specifically is agricultural robotics. Plants are different, rows are different. So you have to create a system that can adjust moment by moment to its changing environment. And that implies a certain level of learning and adjusting. So that, that area of machine intelligence is what fascinates me. But along the way, I've, I've had to deal with uh, distributed intelligence. Um, a lot of these questions that because of my math background, I, I can actually think deeper into and then realize that it, it throws up questions for my faith. So originally a lot of these things just started as looking at the science and the math and going, wow, that really poses some tough questions for my, my spiritual walk in life. And uh, I can't talk about these things to my pastor or anybody. That's how I think I ran across Paul Vanderclay, because mm -hmm. I, I listened to one of his talks and I, on YouTube and I thought, wow, now here's a pastor I might actually be able to talk to and ask these questions without getting flamed in return. Mm -hmm. But I think emergence answers a lot of questions. It raises a lot of questions. Um, there's a lot more details. Um, the people who speak on it, they come from separate disciplines. They're, and so they're speaking on uh, from their opinion, not from some research project. Um, there's no standard definition. So you're kind of on your own in the field. You said earlier in the video, and, and I apologize, it must be a function of my memory, but at one point you said, so you had come up with a, defi a working definition for yourself of what emergence is mm -hmm. based on a more rigorous um, scientific paradigm. Mm -hmm. 
So what is that? What is that definition that you're using? You probably uh, already said it, but I didn't. I didn't write it down. So uh, I'm, I'm looking at it from the theory of computation that you're you're creating emergent systems. Again, the game of life is a perfect example. And each cell in in the array is a state machine. You can. I'm not sure I've seen anyone do work on arrays of coupled state machines. Um, but then you get to that undecidability question that you can show that starting from simple rules and a simple key and lock mechanism kind of level of thinking create behaviors which are not decidable. There, there's no way algorithmically you can figure out what's going to happen until you just let the program run and see it happen. And to me, that that is what they're talking about when they were trying to get the handle on strong emergence. Some people use, they, they talk about being unexpected or um, and I, I, that's not a good word because hmm. Well, maybe this is a good place for me to ask the question that I had at the very beginning that I said I'd hold off on about at the beginning okay. of the universe when at the Big Bang. And this is very rough cut, okay? So at the Big Bang, um, all the, this is the way I look at it anyway, all the resource that was necessary to build the universe, you know, came into mm -hmm. being. And, and that we know that because E equals MC squared, that a very tiny amount of matter will create a huge amount of energy. So when you think about the massive amount of matter that there is in the universe, the amount of energy that there was at the Big Bang is completely incomprehensible, okay? So, so this massive, massive, massive trillion times more than we can ever imagine or think amount of energy bursts into into and makes a universe. Um, very quickly, hydrogen was there and then helium. And then until stars started to form when there was all this heat coming out of the, the movement of the gases and everything, that heat was what was required to build the rest of the chemical element table. Now, <clears throat> This is just part of what's happening. I mean, there's a lot of things happening. And the physicists will always say that, that there's this set of parameters or rules or the way that we describe what happened in the universe. You know, maybe it wasn't rules, we're just describing what happened. But, but certainly buried inside all of those things, there are some rules. <laughs> One of the rules is that a minus hooks up to a plus and, mm -hmm. and a minus won't hook up to a minus and a negative and a plus won't hook up to a plus. It has to be a minus and a plus. Mm -hmm. That's a rule. That's not just an yeah. observation. So that rule had to be part of the resource that was plugged into the universe along with the energy and the mass, mm -hmm. the, re the resource that was there. Those rules were part of the system from the beginning. I mean, I, I don't understand why it's, I mean, maybe I'm missing something because I'm not a physicist. And so, and physicists say that this could all happen on its own. If you just, I, I think it was Hawking that said, just give me gravity and I can create a universe. Well, yeah, okay. So where do you get the gravity? <laughs> yeah. But, um, but it's not only gravity, you also need a rule that makes a minus hook up to a plus. Just at the most fundamental, that's the fundamental lock and key. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that rules have to come from someplace. That's well, so so is there a sense in which the entire universe is if somebody were looking at it at the very beginning, would be undecidable? Could be. Well, one of the fundamental questions, did the rules, the laws of physics and the rules we, of, we call math and logic, did they come into being with the creation of the universe? 
or did they pre-exist the known universe? So a lot of, a lot of physicists say that the laws of physics came into existence with uh, the universe. Now can you talk about anything before? The other way to look at it is the universe is a, the, the laws pre-existed the physical universe and it was out of those laws and rules that the universe, physical universe came from. Mm -hmm. Now the second one sounds an awful lot like the beginning of chapter, you know, creation story of Genesis. Creation. Yeah, I mean, it, it actually makes a lot more sense though, if you look at any other system in the world, because if you're looking at life, um, I've been trying, you know, because we're talking about what is life, trying to go back to even before, you know, totally back to prebiotic life, get all the way back to the nuts and bolts of what it is. And so I'm looking for the very earliest life that, that can be found. And, and I ran across this microbe that was like the earliest thing that they can come up with. And that stupid microbe's genome has 70 million base pairs. <laughs> really? So that 70 million base pairs is information that was already there in that system when that system came into being. So that information came from outside the system. I'm sorry, it had- Yeah, well, there's a, the, the second um, video clip I had, now, I guess now's a good time for that one. Okay. Um, you wanna you want to cue it up before I bring it up or should I just bring it up? Uh, this is, uh, he's a physicist, this is his background and He's been interviewed on questions of emergence, um, and you can you can find him a closer to truth. This was a separate um, talk he was part of, and he says something that is very profound that comes out of the theory of computation, and it's quite quite you know it's I would say it's controversial in the field of science, but if you buy into strong emergence, then it's a natural outcome of that. So wanted to pull it up and let people think about this. Okay. Um, As someone who is a physicist but also thinks in more philosophical terms, what exists is not only physical. If you want to say what exists, it is a big mistake to say that only physical things exist. And so, um, what is an ex we do not be intimidated by reductionists into agreeing that it's only particles and forces that exist, because that isn't true. Um, ideas exist. And so, all right, you may say this involves the brain and it's a complex thing. So instead, let me say the following example, algorithms exist. And an algorithm is a procedure which is used in computers in order to create things. For instance, most of the motor cars that you drive around in today are created in factories because an algorithm is there directing what happens in the factory. And that is the reason that the um, motor car exists. So now, what is an algorithm made of? Is it made of wood or concrete or particles of some kind? The answer is an algorithm is an abstract entity. It is realized in various ways in these computers. And then through that realization, it causes motor cars to come into existence because they wouldn't exist if it wasn't for the algorithm. But the algorithm itself is an abstract entity. So if you want to describe why things exist, not only do you have to think about why particles exist and forces exist, you've also got to think about why abstract entities exist. And I can give you many other examples, but my concrete immediate example is algorithms, which undoubtedly exist. They undoubtedly have causal power in the real world as it exists today. For more debates, talks, and in today, that's really good. Awesome ideas. Oops, and then I, I, I yeah. see made a mistake and I got to go back there and stop that thing or it's going to come out and pop on us again. Okay, I guess we're safe. <laughs> so this takes us full circle back to Landauer's principle that. No, 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 no. I got to, got to undo that. Okay. That the process of computation gives information a physical instantiation. It, it turns physics in, uh, information into energy. It's the coupling. But where is information? That's the same question that speaker just asked. 
you, you know, can you get a bucket of information? Can you buy it by the pound? No, you can't. It's, it doesn't exist anywhere. Um, the program that runs the little parking meter, that's an abstract entity. Where does it exist? Um, that's the, one of the things I, I feel that comes out of strong emergence is it implies that ideas have some kind of physical existence, even though they don't have a physical presence. And that ideas are as much part of the universe as the particles that make us up. So people can think about that and decide whether they agree with it or not. But that is one of the things sitting out there at the frontiers of physics, one of the unanswered questions. And I think we're all entitled to our opinions on that one. Um, well, I mean, at, at one level, it seems so obvious that it's almost a cliche, mm -hmm. but that's the problem with any sort of deep truth. Um, once you start trying to articulate it, it sounds like a cliche. But the, it's not so obvious. The Richard Dawkins, the Sam Harris's of the world will fight that that statement tooth and nail. To them, for them, the only thing that exists is the physical universe, the particles, whatever. And if you buy strong emergence, then you're into the realm where ideas take on a reality all of their own. And I think that gets into a little bit of a spiritual realm. You, you can't be a perfect atheist once you buy into strong emergence. Just, this is purely anecdotal, that the physicists who are most against emergence as a concept are also the ones who are most strongly atheistic in their view. Which gets me back to um, Carl's comment about emergence being a threat to spirituality. Uh, I don't think so. No, it, it, what, it, what it tells you is that there are things that are real which are not physical. And I think once you cross that bridge, um, it's hard to argue against spiritual questions at all. Now, what's so interesting is that that idea is right at the very beginning of our civilization. I mean, those guys back then were so smart. <laughs> when you start talking about evolution, um, maybe we should devolve so we can be as smart as those guys were back 2,500 years ago. <laughs> well, you know, it's funny when you don't have all the computers and you don't have all the 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 the, you know, the stuff in our lives, the technology in our lives, and you just get to think about stuff. Sometimes your brain goes places that you know they, they it doesn't. When computation is so ubiquitous in our lives, we don't think about the deeper questions. I remember when I was a kid, you know, in high school, we used to talk about AI and and overlords and you know robots and stuff and then it seems like the more computers became present in our society people stopped talking about the science fiction kind of aspects of ai um, turing asked some very deep questions about what makes us human what, what does it mean to be intelligent um, and i think the reason he was able to is because there were no computers to distract his thinking process so he could get to a more fundamental level that way. And that's where I kind of wanted to leave uh, this talk. There's um, a video link at the very end of the, the references I, I left you. And I couldn't find a direct link to it on YouTube. So you have to go to and then do the link and then go to, um, what was this? Philip Clayton, his talk, and he's one of the co-authors of the, the book I recommended, Reemergence of Emergence. And he's speaking from a theological point of view, and he touches on the challenges to faith that the concept of emergence and the concept of choice and irreversibility brings. And that is the future is not determined. And does that mean, then you have to ask the question, does God know the future? Or does God only know that which is knowable and the future is not knowable? And that leads into the area called open theology or open theism, yeah, sorry. Mm -hmm. And it's an even deeper question. 
does God forget? And so as a physicist, I run into this stuff and the physics won't let you out of it. There's, there's no graceful way to walk away from that, that fight. But I don't have anyone to talk to on the theological side. So this would be my, my plug to Paul Vanderclay if he wants to dive in and try and deal with these kind of questions. Well, earlier on, and maybe a year ago on my channel, I had a conversation about this with Esther O'Reilly. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think I also had a question, I think I also had a conversation about it with Michael. I have to go back and find them and I'll, I'll link to them in the, in the description to the video too. Um, because this whole question of open theism is very, very interesting question. And I know some people look at it as being heretical, but I also think there are ways of thinking about it that are not heretical. And, uh, and we had some really good conversations about it. So yeah. well, a lot I, of people would consider it heretical or just write it off, but the arguments don't go away. You know, they're, they're sitting there waiting to be answered, so. Well, and I also think it's any of these things when they're based on fear, somehow, um, I'm very simple-minded because there is no fear in love. God's perfect love drives out all fear. So when we really trust that God is God and that I am not, then, then I think we can explore these ideas with a recognition of God's perfect love and his perfect goodness and explore where those ideas go inside that universe. And, mm -hmm. and I don't think there's any fear in where those things go. I, I think there are some very interesting aspects to the whole idea of kind of a flexibility that's built into the future mm -hmm. of, of, of opportunity of allowing each human to become uniquely who they are intended to become through the choices that they make and through the failures that they experience and through the the triumphs that they walk in you know the whole thing it's it's this open field of possibility and, and i so i don't think there's anything heretical in that well i think that's a definition of growth mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah well, so we'll have our homework cut out for us then. Yeah, and yeah. I imagine I I left people bewildered and confused, and uh, the next time we might have to just go back and touch base on a lot of the stuff, and maybe dive deeper into emergence. Uh, I can have some notes and and get a lot more specific about different authors and different spokespeople and their different perceptions. Yeah, I th I think it might be good to start next time with a. Um, a kind of a introductory thing where we just lay out the definitions of what we've talked about so far, the conclusions we've come to to this point, and the definitions we've come up with to this point, and then move on from there. Is that okay. reasonable? Yes, give it a try. Okay, I look forward to our email. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Okay, for having me. Bye. Bye.